So I'm sitting up on my roof, it's October 28th, and I'm fixing my solar array once again. And I have to say thanks to YouTube, because the last time I did this, um, I talked a little bit about why I was so frustrated at the fact that this is like the fifth time that I'm having to fix um, this solar panel, because what happens is the, the magpies um, come up here after I fix it, and I put this fresh, shiny, uh, aluminum tape on it and within a couple of days they're up here again pecking away at it and because I did my last YouTube video on this um, in the comment section somebody mentioned that uh, magpies are really attracted to shiny things so you know what's the definition of insanity trying to solve the same problem over and over again using the exact same solution and not getting a different result um, I think it's something like that anyways and so you think that as an engineer and um, you know somebody that thinks in whole systems that um, I would have picked up on that but you know we all have our own biases and our own problems so um, here I am again so now I'm going to uh, put on some new pieces some new insulation um, except that this time I'm going to use a different coating on the outside in order to uh, prevent the magpies from being attracted to pecking it or whatever it is that they're trying to get out of this aluminum tape. I can't imagine it's good for them. <clears throat> Anyhow, as I was doing this, I was thinking about technology because this is a technology right here. Um, specifically about a book that I read several years ago um, from a gentleman named Ronald Wright. And uh, the book was entitled A Brief History of Progress. And uh, such a good book that CBC decided to do a Massey Lecture series on it, um, in which Ronald Wright actually read most of his book um, over a period of six lectures. And it was absolutely incredible. I highly, highly recommend that book. And so as I was you know, working on this technology, one of the things I think a lot about is the concept of appropriate technology, which is... Um, technology with you know tr truthfully I don't really have a good definition for appropriate technology I'd love to hear um, what you guys think is appropriate technology but essentially it's it's technology with a heart or um, technology that has a purpose that's not going to um, cause you see I don't even know how to define this so I'd love your guys's take on what makes technology appropriate um, and, but the thing is, is I can describe what I think is not appropriate um, in terms of examples um, or analogies um, that exist right now. And that's really what I've been spending a lot of time thinking about. Um, one of the kind of things that I think a lot about is how technology is going to impact my kids, specifically disruptive technology like AI um, and uh, you know, autonomous machines and things like that. And, you know, given that I'm in the permaculture field and I'm an engineer and, and that I do embrace a lot of technology, I constantly am asking myself, um, you know, what is the line? Like, where, where does technology cross over that line and no longer become appropriate? And it's kind of a bit of a blurry, a blurry line, especially after reading a book like uh, What Technology Wants by Kevin Kelly, another incredible book on technology. Um, the last year I've been trying to read as many books as I can uh, on subjects that I don't necessarily agree with or try and stay away from. And so I've been sp spending a lot of time reading about AI and, and um, what some people are assuming or predicting will be the implications um, as a result of um, all of this autonomy and machine learning and all of these things. Um, and I've been doing it, number one, because I don't necessarily agree with the use of it. Um, for my own biases and reasons, but also because I'm trying to understand how to make decisions right now about my kids' upbringing um, and, and what I need to teach them to prepare them for the next uh, 100 years, basically. And one of the things that I always think about is what's going to be rare, um, what's going to be valuable. We know that a lot of this machine learning is going to replace a lot of uh, meaningful jobs. Um, because machines will be able to do it faster, cheaper, maybe even better. Um, and so what will the role of humans be in the next 100 years? And it's, I think it's a really difficult question to answer. The only things that I've been able to, to come up with are, um, you know, being able to look people in the eye, being, being able to hold a conversation, creativity, 
um, self-confidence. These are all the things that we're seeing right now are being eroded through the use of social media and technology. And so if you can teach children um, all of those skills, which is ostensibly, I mean, I think most kids are born with it actually. I think um, a lot of the things that we do in our instructional process and the way that we raise children are, are the actual um, activities that erode those those things that children naturally have. Um, and maybe in a future video I'll talk a little bit about some of my philosophies, although um, it's tough to call them philosophies yet because I'm learning real time, um, like a lot of other dads uh, and moms out there. So again, I'd love to hear any of your comments on um, how you guys are addressing this whole um, technological paradox. And I would love to hear your thoughts on how you guys are um, preparing your kids for the future. Um, specifically around technology and, and what you think is going to be rare and, and put them in, in um, a good position for the next hundred years. Um, the other thing that I've been thinking a lot of lately around the technology space um, are my predictions for the next five to ten years. And so um, I, uh, I'm not a big fan of predictions. I obviously make them like everyone else, but I put a caveat on here that um, all of my predictions are going to be false. Um, they're just my thoughts um, about you know the present day in terms of where I think things are going um, but I don't make any kind of claims about uh, knowing what the future actually is going to hold and so whenever I make a prediction um, for myself um, the chances of it being right are very very slim uh, because there's an, a million possible outcomes there's too many moving parts it's hyper complex and um, the chances that it's actually going to be right are, are, are very very small so I think it's important not to, if you do make a prediction or you think about what things might occur in the future, that you're humble about those ideas um, so you don't plan your entire life around them, essentially. Um, so I've been watching John Deere and uh, various other tractor manufacturers build battery-powered tractors. Um, I think that... Uh, um, I'm not sure the name of the tractor company, but there is one right now that has come up with a self-driving cabless tractor. Um, I look at some of the pig barns that exist out there right now in the industrial meat um, arena, and most of the, the pigs that are raised right now don't actually need any human interaction. All of the gates, feeding operations, water, light, fans, it's all automated. I mean, we're basically at that point right now where um, we're raising animals in the same way that um, the Matrix depicted the raising of humans, which is very interesting. Um, so very quickly we're moving into a space where humans aren't even going to be needed in the production of food. And so one of my predictions is that um, there's going to be an emergent um, certification body or certification that farmers who decide that having humans involved in agriculture and food production um, are going to embrace something along the lines of um, uh, made by humans or grown by humans. Um, and the reason that you might want your food to be raised by humans as opposed to machines is that um, humans still have emotion and they have feelings and they are um, conscious. conscious. Um, and, and as of right now, we know that machines are not. Maybe one day in the future they will be, which raises a whole other conversation. Um, but if humans are conscious, there's still a chance that they can make a decision about what is ethically correct and what's ethically not correct. You could argue that that could be programmed into the algorithm, but the minute that um, humans are not in tractors anymore, there's no really real upper limit with regards to how much spray can be put onto these crops, fertilizer, herbicides, pesticides, fungicides. Um, we very quickly enter into a space similar to interstellar. Um, there's no um, real rules with regards to how animals are treated um, and how those systems are automated. And so this is where I think, you know, technology... Um, you know, edges on no longer being appropriate anymore. Um, and so it kind of kind of scares me. But on, on the other hand, if you think about the opportunities that exist, because the problem is always the solution, I think that there is going to be a growing number of people that don't want their meat grown in Petri dishes, um, that want their animals being raised outdoors. And there's plenty of reasons for that. Um, I've, I've talked about it in another video, but one of the largest sources of vitamin D in the Northern Hemisphere is actually the fat um, that is produced inside of naturally raised animals um, that have access to solar energy or, or, or sunlight. 
Um, not to mention all the fat profile of an animal that's raised with the appropriate um, exercise and diet is going to be far healthier for you than um, anything that's raised without that. So, um, yeah, I think technology is a really interesting thing. And, um, you know, as I start designing more and more of these off-grid homesteads, resilient homes, acreages, and farms, um, I'm definitely noticing a pattern with the people that are hiring us um, that they definitely are feeling similar um, angst around what is appropriate and what is not appropriate technology. Um, and so, you know, what is the difference between a smartphone and a hammer or a smartphone and a plow or an AI protocol or, or piece of software and, um, you know, uh, a, 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 C, um, a drill seed, a seed drill, sorry. Um, and like, where, where do you cross that line? Um, technology is ubiquitous with humans. Humans have been using tools for forever, basically. Tools are part of who we are as humans. But I'm really contemplating these days with regards to um, what that line actually is. And I read this quote once, um, I think it was in Kevin Kelly's book, uh, um, with regards to the book that he wrote, uh, What Technology Wants. And he basically said that technology that emerges in your life, your own personal life, before you're 35 is con considered to be totally normal and appropriate and then anything that comes after you're 35 um, is basically disruptive and should not be allowed and so humans especially as we get older tend to be very resistant of, resistant of change and so I'm trying to make sure that I'm being conscientious of that and not um, creating super strong biases against technology that will end up backfiring um, with regards to how I'm raising my kids or potentially how I choose to live my life later in life as, as technology becomes even more and more ubiquitous um, with regards to how we choose to live on this planet. By technology, again, I just said there's no difference between a hammer and a smartphone. Um, I'm specifically talking about the stuff that is currently in development or, or being rolled out um, because I certainly feel that things are changing faster than they ever have. And so um, my prediction in the next five to 10 years is that most food that is sold in the kind of major grocery store chains are going to be grown by machines. Um, and along with that, I think there's all sorts of interesting consequences that are very difficult to predict, um, you know, around what that actually means in terms of the quality of food, um, the feedback mechanisms, who's gonna end up owning the food production. Um, I think the counter force because there's always a counter force to every force there's always a, a yin and a yang i think the counter force to robotically grown food um, that that uh, essentially disrupts current agriculture is actually not to encourage more farmers necessarily to grow um, uh, food grown by humans although that could be one response um, and that probably will emerge but i actually think it's a return back to growing food on our own um, turning our own front and backyards into uh, vegetable gardens, um, having a small flock of chickens or ducks um, that don't require necessarily massive grain inputs that um, allow us to use the waste products that come out of our homes um, right in our backyard. I think that's the actual solution. Um, that's the only solution that can actually counter the centralized control of food production. And the thing that worries me most about the automation and roboticization of food production, um, outside of just only having a couple of corporations that own all of the production, that's horrible. Um, all of the um, uh, genetics potentially being owned by a couple of the um, of corporations is number one, um, coming back to um, uh, Ronald Wright's book, uh, brief history of progress is he talks about these concepts of, of, of progress traps um, and essentially what a progress trap is is when humanity makes a huge technological leap like the nuclear bomb or um, we could say self-driving cars or self-driving tractors uh, they act as check valves in society and these check valves um, once we fully embrace them um, in fact agriculture was kind of like one of these progress traps is once we started to control our own food system um, we no longer knew how to hunt and gather in the same way that we did before agriculture. So um, the roboticization and automation um, and centralization of food is slowly dumbing us down so that we're no longer responsible for our own food system. And 
um, that's the thing that I fear the most is that in a hundred years from now, we might have a culture of people that don't know how to grow their own food anymore. And so we become completely dependent on these centralized food systems, um, which is totally susceptible to black swans or massive disruptions um, of the negative kind. So for example, if your entire food system depends on electronics and electricity, and you have a massive solar flare, you don't have the capability of growing food anymore because your centralized electronic food growing mechanism is now completely toast. Um, or if in order to centralize food, we end up having to eat, shrink the genetic diversity that we're currently utilizing right now even smaller than it already is, which is terrifying. Um, one disease could wipe out the entire planet's crop of corn, let's say. So I think the solution is decentralization of food, which and like the ultimate expression of decentralization of food is actually hunting, hunting gathering. But I don't think we're going back there right yet. Maybe you know, well into the future when humans have evolved uh, beyond agriculture. But in the interim, I think it's learning how to garden like farmers and farm like gardeners. Um, it's actually bringing food right back down onto our own properties. Uh, learning how to grow it as, as, as humans, we end up with the vitamin D that we get by being outside. We maintain a skill that's absolutely essential. We have to eat every day. Um, and the food that you can't produce, you're ultimately going to probably buy it from a centralized system. But at least if that centralized system was to crash one day for any number of reasons, water constraints, um, you know, solar flares, um, viruses like if there was a like not just a biological virus but a computer virus um, at least we're not going to all starve to death essentially and I know that sounds a little alarmist but if you actually do the risk analysis on it I think you'll agree that I'm not all that out to lunch um, and so while I don't know when or if any of this is gonna happen these are the things that I think about uh, every day I see new examples of automation and technology that are potentially creating progress traps that are going to end up biting us in the ass down the road. Anyways, this is a huge mammoth of a topic and probably one that I could create several videos on. I'd love to get your take on it and see what your thoughts are. Leave them in the comments below and um, if there's any other videos that kind of address these types of issues that you've found to be very poignant, I'd love it if you'd share them with me. I'd love to watch them um, or blogs or any other resources. So hopefully you found this interesting. Um, if you want more of these types of videos, hit the subscribe button. Um, if you want to check out some of the stuff that we do, you can check it out at vergepermaculture.ca. We've got several free courses that you can take, one on introduction to permaculture and one on designing your own adaptive habitat, uh, your resilient home acres or farm. Um, and like I said, I love your comments, so leave some comments below and I uh, look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. Thanks so much.